when it comes to festivals, there's no way of getting around. People are picking or not picking your films. And it's the diversity of voices in the room, which is why there are films that play really big festivals and then don't play anywhere else. Paul Sloop, welcome to Crafty. Thank you, Alexander. It's a pleasure to be here. So, I first of all, I think you're the proclaimed king of short films. I've, I've heard so many filmmakers say that, you know, it's like when you think short films, you think Paul Sloop. Um, and so the first question that I have for you has nothing to do with, you know, I'm sure what filmmakers are curious about with festivals and stuff like that, but how did you get the bug for short films? How did short films become a part of your life? Yeah, I, th I think that term is just because I've been around so long. I fell in love with shorts many, many years ago at the festival where I got my start. That's the Cleveland International Film Festival uh, in Cleveland, where I live. Um, I went to the festival, oh, wow, back in the late 80s. And I went to see a film called My Life as a Dog. Uh, and and this is what's crazy is that I was one of those people who like watched Hollywood films and had, you know, had no use for subtitled films. And like, why would you want to read when you're going to the movies? Who wants that? And of course, someone convinced me to go see this film, My Life as a Dog, mm. uh, which was a subtitled film um, and was amazing. Just blew me away. And I'm like, OK, wrong. I've been so wrong. So wrong. Um, uh, and, but then I grabbed a guide for the festival and saw something called short film programs. And I was like, what's a short film program? And I went the next uh, day, I went back and I went to the short film program and it was great. It was this collection of films that had no connection to each other, uh, you know, different genres. And, you know, I didn't love all of them, but I loved several of them. And it was like, when am I, I, I go to a feature film and I'm stuck in it, whether I like it or not. Uh, but with a short film program, like there's six or seven films and invariably I'm going to find something I like. And I only, if I'm not enjoying something, it's going to be over soon. Um, <laughs> you know, so I, I fell in love with them, started going. And from then on for years, I would buy tickets to every shorts program and then whatever features I could fit in around the shorts. Um, and it was a long time from then till the time where I actually got invited to become a volunteer previewer for the festival. Uh, uh, ultimately, I ended up getting asked to be a part of the programming team with the head of it, who was uh, someone who taught film at Case Western Reserve University. And when he moved on, uh, they asked him who he would recommend they get to replace him. And he recommended me. And they asked me and I said, yes, and I've been doing it ever since. Uh, and that was 2003. Wow. So this is my 21st year heading up shorts at Cleveland, uh, but I've been involved and around it for even longer than that. So I remember going to Cleveland in 2016 um, with the bespoke tailoring of Mr. Bellamy and the appetite for shorts in Cleveland in particular just seems great. And it, it seems like the, the community that you've built around short programming there is just so inviting and so uh, excited about the, the material. So how did how did that community look when you first got there and how has that community changed since you've been there? Uh, you know, I think it was there and just continues to grow uh, because there were me's. I mean, I, I was one of the members of that audience. Um, Cleveland, they just built a passionate following for film period at that festival uh, and shorts, got lumped in. You have to think what's great about Cleveland is now it's huge, right? So there's all these selections of features and shorts, but back when I went, it was, there wasn't a bunch of choices. Like there were only a few things to see and shorts were one of them. So shorts were part of it from very early. So once it did expand to where now there's four options of features you could be watching while the shorts are running. By the time that happened, people already had been going to the shorts. So there were people like me who were like, yeah, I don't care what other features you're playing, you know, and plus that, you know, they all got multiple show times that the features did. So you could work around it for years when we had all kinds of features, you'd have people with their guides figuring out, okay, I can't, I'm going to this shorts program. So that's this feature I wanted to see when's its other screening. 
and they would map out and plan their whole schedule so they could see the shorts programs and not miss features they'd want to see. Um, but also with the knowledge, much like I am as a shorts fan, that the features, it's going to be a whole lot easier for me to find the features after yeah. the festival, somewhere down the totally. road, than finding an inv any of these individual shorts. So, you know, I think our audience in Cleveland really gets that. Um, and, you know, typically in the top 25% of attended programs at our festival, all the shorts are in the top, you know, each program would be somewhere in that top 25% because there's wow. just that many people who are dedicated to, yeah, I'm going to the shorts, just like I was. So cool. So I, I kind of want to dive into the nitty gritty. There are entire Reddit forums dedicated to film festivals and notifications. And, you know, uh, I, I got a screening, I got a view from, uh, Louisiana, which festival do you think that's from or, you know, whatever. And right. so you, you uh, are obviously the, the short film person for Cleveland. Uh, you do film Pittsburgh and you do Cordillera. Correct. And I wondered if you could sort of take us behind the scenes um, for what it looks like uh, specifically at your three festivals, but maybe what you know across the board for what short film programming looks like, um, you know, the review process and that kind of thing, and just kind of help take down the curtain because, you know, I think I think there's a lot of filmmakers out there that are like, it's so secretive and it's so, you know, whatever. And they don't like me and, you know, whatever. Yes. Yeah. And and you know me well enough to know from being at Film Prize that like, yeah, yeah I don't believe in the curtain. Like, right. we can sit down and talk about it. Let's just go through it. And, and I totally and largely it's because of the respect and passion I have for the filmmakers who are creating these films. This should not be as miserable a process as it seems to be. Uh, for them. And it is because there's just, who do you ask? Who do you know? Um, yeah. So all three of mine and almost all the festivals I know have some variation of this. It's going to look very similar. You submit your film to a film festival and off it goes into the ether and you never know what happens again. Well, what happens is uh, there are, every festival has a team of typically volunteers, previewers, but those volunteers are people like me who already love the shorts and have said, hey, yeah, I'll spend hours of my time watching short films to find ones that are really, really good or that I love and recommend to the programming team. Um, at all three of my festivals, it works the same way. We have a certain number of minimum views. Um, Cleveland, in every one of those cases, it's three. We want at least three people to have seen every film that's going to either be accepted or passed on. Um, in Cleveland, it ends up being even more than that because it's such a big process. Three is the minimum, uh, but our programming team alone in Cleveland is an additional six people. Um, but it but it goes through three processes. I'm going to give you Cleveland's because it's the most complex, but sure. it's a variation of this everywhere. So those three people will score the films, and if they score high enough, uh, they move on to us. And the threshold is fairly low. Like think ten point system, it's seven point five. Anything seven point five or above is going to move on. Invariably, that's about one in every three or four films that's submitted and we get about 4,000 submissions of films. So that means about a thousand of those films are going to make it past the first round. Um, now we have a team of eight at the programming level. There are four of us. There's myself and three people who as of this year are now paid members of the programming team. So they truly are programmers. They're not just members of the team. And then four junior programmers. So each team is one of us seniors and one junior programmer. We divide those that come through the first round into four pools. What every one of those two teams is going to watch the film. Um, so the film, let's say we just did the December export and there were 26 films per team that made it through with this round. We do it once every month. So uh, my partner and I will watch the 26 films we watched. And if we scored an average of 8.5 or better, or either one of us gives it a nine or better. Everybody has to watch it. Mm. All, all six of the other programmers have to watch it. Only those films that score below that get a nine from neither of us and score an average below 17 points, 8.5. Only those films get passed on at that point. That doesn't mean they're out. They often get saved. We'll put flags for genres, specific programs, you know, fam this one's family. Yeah, we didn't score at 17, but it's family. So like almost all the families and after hours films get watched whether they scored high enough or not. Um, once all eight people have watched the film, now if, if you scored high enough, now everybody on that team is going to watch it. 
And based on those cumulative scores, we're going to end up with a list that in Cleveland, we use the term the hot list. There's going to be a list of films by the time we get to early February. Um, when we meet, we meet like the second week of February this year. We're going to sit down and pick the films. Um, we don't do it. None of my festivals do any significant early acceptance. So I know some do acceptance on a rolling basis. Mm-hmm. We don't do that because we want to know that we've seen everything before we pick films and then go, oh, wow, you know, we got 90% of the best films came in the last month or something. That's never happened. But um, bottom but line could. is, but it could, it could. Yeah. And, in th- and the bottom line is you want to know that you're comparing everything to everything you've seen. But in my opinion, that's really important that at the point you're making selections, um, you've only, if you've given a handful of early se- selection it's small. Like in Cleveland, we do 10 or 11. And that's because we do a special program called Get Shorty that happens so early to the festival that we have to have those films. And I'm not going to ask for permission to play for what is a thousand people come to this event. It's a great short film event um, that helps ramp up the enthusiasm for the festival. I'm not going to ask anybody to play in that event that isn't going to be in the festival because that's when the filmmakers themselves get to attend and celebrate uh, with us. So those films, once our team selects those for that program, those are the only ones that get early admission. Everything else then ends up on a hot list. That hot list is typically two to three times the number of films we can actually program. It's sure. never, I don't think it's ever been three. It's usually two to 2.5. So like last year, we had 162 spots we ended up filling and we had 360 some films that were alive going into that discussion. So, you know, it'd be have to be 480 to be three X. The bottom line is we pick from those films. We pick specifically for the type of programming we do. We do not theme programs here. We do have an after hours program and a family program. Those are obviously, they're still not a theme. They're right. films that have to Just fit genre. the right genre. Right. Yeah. But the genres are broad. Like we call it after hours because it can be dark comedy, sci-fi, really scary thriller, horror films, what we call the WTF films. Like, what was that? I can't, <laughs> I'll never stop thinking about it. Like, I don't know what I saw, but it was crazy. And people are going to go, wow, that was crazy. Um, all those films go in our, and we blend them to create this roller coaster ride in all of our blocks of experiences of short films. Um, anyway, we picked that way. Uh, we specifically for our numbered programs have labeled every film as to what beat it fit, fits. So this is really going behind the curtain. I know I'm giving you a lot here, but you want behind I the curtain. It. Like this it. is, this is how specific it is. And all my festivals do it this way. Once we've liked the film enough to keep it alive, we're going to flag it either, either as a straight drama. That means it, typically those are the darker dramas. There's nothing redeeming in it. If you cry, you cry out of like the world sucks kind of feeling. Um, the heart films, the heart films are the dramas that might make you cry, but in a beautiful human, I like to say the hardest human connection films. Like, yeah, you, you, you are reminded why it is something special to be alive and to be human. Um, even if it made you cry and sad in a way, it's beautiful sadness. Um, it doesn't have to be sad though. It can just be a beautiful connection film. Those are the heart films. There's the comedies, um, documentaries, animated films and wild cards. Those are the six beats. Every program is going to have one of those beats in it. The only I love that. The only beat that is hard to define is wild card, hence the name. Sure. Uh, and that's because you're not going to have. So in Cleveland, the number likely this year will be 12 numbered programs again. Um, the blended mixtape programs. Uh, you're not going to have 12 sci-fi films. You're not going to have 12 thrillers. You're not going to have 12 music videos. You're not going to have 12, you know, premiere episodes for some kind of series. Um, those are, are beats we find where we love it and we put it in a wild card because it's like, yeah, we're not going to have 12 music videos, but we'll have three. And the music video is a totally different beat than any of the other five. So it's the wild card beat in that. And you never know what you're going to get with that. Most of our programs will have seven films in it, which means one of the beats will be repeated and it'll be based on what that program feels like. Do we need more heart? Do we need more comedy? Um, was the 
was the doc a super short three minute doc? And so we can play a 12 minute, you know, and get that 15 minutes in, whatever. The, the point is they're six or seven long and they have all of those beats. And that's programming wise, what's most important to me that we have all those beats, but that's what's happening at my festivals. We're really getting it down to what beat is your film going to fill? And the great thing from my perspective about that is at no point am I asking any short film to help with a theme. It simply needs to be one of the 12 best comedies, one of the 12 best heart films, one of the 12 best documentaries, one of the 12 best animated films based on what our team thinks. I mean, I keep using the term best for the taste of what our programmers think. That's what we're yeah. choosing. So we don't sit down and go, okay, which 160 films are we going to play? We literally then go through each of those flags. And typically just because this matters a lot, the easier ones to do is, all right, let's pick the family programs because there's only certain films that even fit there, right? So right. there's 24 films for 18 slots. You know, time-wise, you don't even have to trim much. It's just pick them. After hours, okay, we've got 48 films. We're going to have two programs, which are, you know, typically it's 18 to 20 make it because a lot of those are shorter. You pick the specialty programs and you're the last thing you're always left with is, all right, we've got our 12 numbered programs. Let's go through the categories. What are our comedies? What are the comedies you can't live without? And the team goes through and they just start weighing in. And then you do the same thing with each of those categories. And then when you, once you pick the 12, you stop and you go, how much runtime is that? Because each program can be about 95 minutes. And I've got right. this method. I'm like, okay, we have 185 minutes left and we need 12, you know, so let's go through all the things that didn't quite make it off any of the list. What are the, your best things? What are the things that, oh, great. I really, really want to show this heart film. I really, really want to. And the team, like the term gets thrown around in our meetings. I went to the mats for that film. It's like the little wars that happened in the room where someone's like, I'm not leaving this table without that film in this festival. Like, you know, we're just not doing it. Um, it's been, I used to be that person when I was one of the volunteer judges. Now, because I'm sort of responsible for the whole team process, I'm always the voice of reason in the middle. I, you know, sure. I, I don't ever, it's already, it's too heavy handed to be the programmer. So I typically have to count on the team to have loved the things I really loved. I, I do not ever want to be viewed as a dictator. Plus, as you know, I go to all these events and meet these filmmakers and there's like some of my best friends in the world. They're the people I care about most. The last thing I want to do is be the person actually picking between their films by myself. Totally. Totally. I, I just, I weigh in, but I leave it up to my teams to narrow down and figure out which films they want to play. Plus it's each for a different community, right? Like Coeur d'Alene is in Reno, Nevada. It's a totally different community. So I really need the people there to weigh in on what, which ones really are going to resonate with that community. Cleveland, I have a really good beat myself. I do know sure. that. And Pittsburgh is where I'm from, but it is a little bit different in Pittsburgh than Cleveland. So I do like to lean a lot on uh, what the Cleveland folks have had to say about which films really rose to the top in their minds. Yeah. So you, I mean, you've brought up so many crucial things that filmmakers, I think, need to think about, would, namely being uh, genre and, and length. Um, and, you know, I guess to maybe kick this off, I'd love to hear in your mind, what are some of the kind of over overdone cliches, some of the like, some of the danger points that the filmmakers need to look out for if they want their film to be programmable. Obviously, I think there's value in any film being made, like any filmmaker that completes a project has done something absolutely amazing. But there are certain things that make it a lot easier, I imagine, to program a film. And, and I'd love to know what you think those are. Let me start with the broadest thing. I do want to tackle what you had about the cliches. But first, I want to say that the thing I like to say about short films, because we're always asked, like, how do you know what what's the right thing? Tight and right. Keep that in your mind. Make Stay right on your through line. That's the right part. Like, what's the story you're telling? Don't wander. It's a short film. It's not a feature. You don't have time for all the subtext. It's what's the story you're telling? Stay on that through line. That's right on point and tight. Make it as tight as you can. If the film can be 15 minutes and that's as short as it can be and tight as it can be, that's your film. If it's 30 minutes, that's fine. It just, if it's tight and right on, 
we play plenty of 30 minute films. So I can never tell people always say, what's the right runtime? I can tell you what the average runtime is that make the festivals, which is a number that's been going up over, especially since the pandemic, the average runtime of 15 is now closer to 18. We're seeing oh, wow. way more 20 minute, 20 something shorts than we used to. Um, I do think out there, there is this idea that 15 is kind of ideal and that's mm -hmm. probably true. I'm, if I'm telling you I have six or seven films per program and I'm shooting for 90, 95 minutes, that's about 15 minutes per film. But there are a lot of films that are five minutes long that accomplish something that are palate cleansers because they're funny and they're cute and they do what they're meant to do. Men, hey, I made a short film to make you laugh. That's great. That has yeah. immense value in a shorts program. And it doesn't need to be 15 minutes long to be respectable, you know, great work. Um, so make your film tight and right. So I, I want to jump in for a second and talk about our friend uh, John Beach, because, you know, talking about the tight and right, you know, his film, uh, They Grew Up So Fast, it's it's gone and played Tribeca, it played Cleveland, it played all of your festivals, I think, and, yeah. it, and it's played every festival known to man. And I, I talked to him a little bit about um, his edit. And, you know, I think he started with a, a 16 or 17 minute film. And then his, you know, he and his editor worked on it and they got it down to 12. And it is that his editor was like, I think we can get this under 10. And John was like, no way. There's no way it can be under 10. And they did a cut and the under 10 length felt really right for that film. And, you know, going into the tight and right, this is a film that, that's trying to make you laugh. It's got heart, but it just, it, it so perfectly just found that rhythm and the way that that film worked. And so I think I would, you know, in addition to what you're saying, challenge filmmakers to really look, try to look objectively as, at your edit as, as possible. I know it's so it's so hard when you're so close to the material, um, but yeah, no. And I, you, we were having this discussion recently, a couple of programmers and I, with the fact that I wonder how many feature filmmakers are the stars they are because they found the editors they found. Yeah, because that that the, the last cut, the film that we see, the story that actually makes the screen, is what the editor found. Yeah, in everything that was shot, right? So your best friend, I would say two the person who did your sound and the person who does your edit are probably your two best friends as a filmmaker. Find two people who are really good at those things. You're going to be way ahead of the crowd already. Um, because yeah, the edit is what creates right. Yeah. That, right on the point. And, tight and right. That It really is in the hands of the editor to stay on the story with what it's cutting and get it down as tight as I can to tell that story. Yeah. Um, to your other question, the cliche part. Yeah. Um, to me, that's an issue of authenticity. I don't think what makes a film feel cliche is not covering the same topic that we've seen over and over again, but covering it in the exact same way, not bringing sure. anything new to the table uh, on that topic. Um, we can, and, and you, it's hard to quantify what that is because the story can actually be just the same. But if you have a story that is very personal to you and the way it looked and felt in your world, it can be the same story somebody else told, but by you bringing what it meant and felt to you in your film, it'll land with us different. We feel the authenticity of a film. I don't, there's no way to explain it. Um, yeah. Because it's like, you know, it's like the X factor in a short film that everybody has this universal, there's this universal response to it, but you can't pin it on, you, you know, different people say different things. Oh, the actor was so good or the, the dialogue or what, you know, you can, for different people. I'm like, and to me, it's like, yeah, I think what bleeds through sometimes in a film is the authentic voices behind it. Yeah. The, the, the people behind it knew what they were, the story meant something to them. But what we felt is that it meant something to them. It wasn't just words on a page, you know, film be digital film being shot, so to speak. It, it meant something. Everybody there was feeling that story and then we feel it with them. Um, so authenticity, you know, tell your story, T tell a story that matters to you. To me, that could be more, more important than almost any advice. Like go find the stories that matter to you and tell them, even tell them because they're funny, tell them because they're, you know, their heart films, whatever they are, that bleeds through to us and it makes an impact. So I think this is probably going to be the hardest question to answer. The 360 films that make it to the the hot list and then the versus the 180 or whatever it is they get they get programmed i think a lot of filmmakers you know that are at that at that point where they're like oh, okay my film is being 
it's 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 so nice to be in that final round and to be considered but it's still such a bummer to get that rejection so what what would you say puts the films or the filmmakers kind of over that edge of being going from hot list to acceptance at a festival look it's that's there's nothing the, the filmmakers love to do to make that hot list you've done the work what it really comes down to and it's the hardest thing to live with as a filmmaker is that when it comes to festivals there's no way of getting around people are picking or not picking your films yeah. and it's and it's the diversity of voices in the room it's how it landed with that which is why there are films that play really big festivals and then don't play anywhere else because it landed right with the Tribeca team. It felt right for them, but, you know, is not making all the other ones they thought they would make after that festival because it just doesn't land the same outside of that team because it's subjective. There's right. nothing about it that is objective when it gets to that point. Um, you can objectively say it's not easy to make that hot list. There were enough people that had to like your film. There was something, and to me, just to get there, that means you've done your job. Totally. You, yeah. what's, what you're stuck with now is that in the end, that last decision gets made subjectively. Um, sure. You know, I do think you could probably go through the top 10 or 20% of films at any festival and know there's a, you know, they played a lot of places in that. And it's because so many elements are Perfect is not the right word, but are just right for an audience. Yeah, they're universal. It's a universal theme that's in the story. The performances are off the chart good. The script is right. You know, everything just came together perfectly, and so you end up with the films like, uh, like Johns. Johns yeah. is so perfect for a short comedy. Yeah, it never stops. The tempo, like you said, is so dead on. So it not only played all the all three of my festivals, it won the comedy award at every festival. Yeah. There's just, you know what I mean? It's like every audience, no matter where it played, just love loved it. that. It's, it's funny to everybody because yeah. it's, it's a universal idea. Parenthood is a universal, you know? Yeah. It, it happens. So it goes by, you know, they grow up so fast. And if you haven't seen the film, you it's, that's loosely the theme of what this is about, but it is the point at the end. Like you right. get it, you totally get it. And yet the whole time you're just laughing at the absurdity of what is happening. Um, totally. And yet it makes such a heart point at the end when you stop and think about it. Oh yeah. As a dad of eight kids, like, yeah, that's, you know, it doesn't happen in the way it does in his story, but the underlying theme is so true that you blink and the next thing you know, wait, what? How, yeah. Where did, where did it all go? But it, it is, it's all the films after that top 10% that are really the same. They're finding yeah. their subjective crowd, which is what the worst thing to ever say to to send an email to a festival. Well, I made this festival and that festival. Why am I not good enough for whatever festival yeah. just told you no? Oh. It, because it's not about good enough. It really isn't. It's subjective. It's like, yeah. in the end, it's that you, it's, you should never say I got rejected by Cleveland. There were, at the most, eight people. Yeah. Eight people connected to that city and typically many times it's three right three human beings decided that they didn't like my film enough sure that shouldn't tell you anything about your film it might you might have some work to do if those, that happens over and over again okay i've got to go back to the drawing board you know but if you're getting into some festivals but not others that's just that's a subjective part of the process and there are totally. so totally. many short films right they're just so many well, and you brought up such a good point just there. Like <laughs> the worst thing that you can do is because, you know, I run a small, very small festival in Arkansas and I've even gotten these emails like you're an idiot you for not programming my work. And it's of course, it's like, you know, just you don't don't do that. Don't be a dick. And that's right. that's just how you should <laughs> how you should live life in general. But yeah. Uh, yeah, no, it's it's so it is so subjective and. You know, like, you know, I wanted to bring up Addy, too, because, you know, I, I think there's there's this maybe this um, perspective in the filmmaking community, like, oh, the ins the people who have the inside on festivals, like the, the in with programmers and that kind of thing, they have a, a better chance of getting in. Well, it's like you've rejected plenty of my films. Yes. And yeah. we've but, played but some and not played some. We, right. we played some and not played some. And Addy 
is my most programmed short film that I've ever made. And that's not even to say that it is, and it's definitely not the best film that I've ever, ever made. Right. I, I, I'm very proud of it, but it fit into that family category. Yes, yes. And, and I, I kind of accidentally stumbled into that and learned a big lesson in doing so. I think I have a 50 something, 52 or 53% acceptance rate, which is insanely high for uh, a festival run. I think Bellamy was 40. And that was like my highest before that. So it's like, yeah, if, and, you, and if you can find a niche. So true. And, you know, Bellamy is, I mean, you know, it's outstanding. That's why you got to know it's subjective because like, I can't imagine in what world some, some team system says no to that film. And yet 60% of them did, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. Like it, 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 that just tells you how subjective it is, right? An Irish Goodbye did not make 100% of the festivals it, it submitted to. Dude, that's what people need to understand. It, yeah. you know, it won the Oscar. Every Oscar winning film Stutter. has been rejected by 50 yeah. or 60. You're absolutely 50 plus percent. Yeah. They did not get in to festivals and they went on to win an Oscar. And the right, and the right response as a filmmaker, even those like, they know that too, right? Like, that's just because it's subjective. Right. There's there's no value in them going na 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 <laughs> to the other 50 percent. Having said that, I totally get it. Right. Like I have never gotten upset at a filmmaker for unleashing on me or whatever, simply because I feel that sense of what the rejection must feel like. And at some point, sure. at some point that it, the emotions get carried away and you didn't take the time to think it through. Count to 10 first. Right. <laughs> I, I'm a big like to me, the film is the child. And the filmmaker is the parent and parents don't always behave so well when their yeah. children don't get accepted. They don't get to start on the team or whatever, but why would you punish the child? And they're going to have more children. So yeah. I, I do get, you know, I can't say that all programmers are like that. I would, as a counselor to other programmers would be saying, just forget, just, just yeah. forget that email because the next film they made may be the best film you've ever seen. You can't just go, I'm never looking at a film from that jackass again. Like totally. They had a bad day. I don't even care. You know, you don't have to apologize to me. Just submit your next film. We're going to be yeah. fair. We're going to be fair. In the end, we're judging art, not filmmakers. How, um, how important or how much of a factor in decision-making, if at all, is a, a celebrity or somebody of note being in the film to you? Does it matter at all? So, no. Well, okay. L let me balance this because I can tell you what happens. If the film is good, it's a plus. Always the film has to be. There are no pluses for a bad film. Yeah. Or a film that doesn't work. Bad's the wrong term. A film that just doesn't work for you or you don't think is going to work for your audience you know, having somebody good in it just demonstrates or recognizable is the right term. Having somebody recognizable in it is a plus for a good film. Yeah. An audience appreciates seeing people that they like in short films. It's, a, it's, there's a level of encouragement to know that, oh, wow, they do this stuff too. That's great. But totally. the film has to be good. And I see just as many films with recognizable talent that are not the thing sure. that are, you know, so yes, it is a plus, but it is not a, Plus, until the film is is good, anyway. For sure, I think I think one of the other things that we haven't talked about is, you know, a lot of these festivals that people are submitting to are international festivals, and you have films not you're not just competing against films in the United States; you're competing against films from all over the world. I guess I guess to put my question bluntly, though, like at a, at a festival like Cleveland or Cordillera or Pittsburgh, you're not saying like, okay, we need to program a certain number of international films no. to keep it an international festival. It's just the best of the best. Uh, the yeah. I mean, that's a plus factor, right? So if it's on the list, one of the things we're breaking out is where's our diversity? Yeah. It's really important to be diverse and that includes countries. But the films yep. have to have made the list. Nobody made the list even thinking about where they're from. Sure. That's just a scoring thing. But once we get to that point, that table, I've done the metrics. Like I bring it to the table. Okay, we have one film from Australia, three from here, two, you know, that are still alive. Yeah. And yeah. we just, we do stop and think about that before we let them go. Um, yeah. Typically, we don't have to. Typically, what we do is we just go through what we want to program 
and then we see that, okay, we've got 23 countries represented here. We're good to go. Kind of falls you know, into place. Yeah. It falls into place. It's, you know, we are aware of it, but it's not a decision-making factor. That's for sure. Cool. Awesome. Um, uh, you've been so generous with your time and with, with kind of, you know, uh, opening up the curtain. I think, I think it's so important for filmmakers to hear this kind of stuff. And, you know, part of what we're trying to do at Crafty is, is some of that educational component as well. Uh, like the best thing that I ever did for myself as a filmmaker was start working for a festival. Cause it's like, it, it's like being at auditions as an actor. It's like watching auditions as an actor. You go, Oh, they just have to cast the part. It's not about me. It's not about like, you know, it takes kind of the, the, that personal sting out of it when you get to witness sort of the behind the scenes. And so I'm hoping this video can, can do that in a small sense for other filmmakers is, is to, you know, go, okay, it's not really, it's not like my little precious baby. They're, they're just like, you know, right. hating on it. It's, it's, you want to find those films to get the best program for your festival. And there's, there's, I'm sure a zillion hard decisions made every single day that you're programming where it's like, oh, I love that film, but it just, I wish it worked better for this audience or I wish it worked better for this festival. Yeah. Um, so is there any little nugget of wisdom that you want to leave, leave the filmmakers with? I would say this, and this was spawned by what you just said. Um, study your craft, study the other films that not just that are doing well, but that you respect and learn the craft behind it. And then do your thing and don't worry about this part. Honestly, because in the end, like your task as a human being, if you've chosen filmmaking, isn't to please film festivals. Yeah. It's to tell your stories, but do it well. So what you don't, where I wouldn't want to deceive myself as a filmmaker is, is on the plus side. Like I made the film, look, it looks great, whatever. Compare it to films, you know, are great. And, yeah. and the technical side of just, what does it look like? What does a good performance look like? What does a good script look like? And keep honing your skills to make your, tell your stories with all the, all those elements there, but then you have to let go. Because it's not your task to get people to like it. Matter of fact, to me, that's probably the way you can go most wrong is to sit there thinking about how to make it more likable to someone at the other end, because that's not authentic. Right. Tell the authentic story and it will find its audience, but do it with all the skills you need. So to me, it's work on the skills and tell authentic stories, but leave the rest to that's somebody else's task. It's that's that's actually tell that that gray space between you and the user that some might call God, some might call just, you know, whatever the, the cosmic strings that exist, that stuff takes care of itself if you stay on your task and not worry about the end user. Paul Sloop, the king of short films, thank you so much for your time. And uh, I think this me. was gonna be super, super valuable for people. So thanks for sharing. Of course, my, my pleasure.